So our panelists for this session are Ben Navarro, an advisor with Fannie Mae, Tanya Plummer, the director of Native American Housing Programs for Enterprise Community Partners, and Libby Starling, the senior community development advisor at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. Welcome to the stage. I'm looking for Todd. He's right, you got it? We just had a little tech moment we have to deal with. Hi guys, people, friends. It's so great to have you here. <laughs> started and introduce ourselves, I want to do one thing because the title of this panel is Elevating Indian Country Beyond the Asterisk Nation, and that title exists because often Native Americans and tribal communities are an asterisk nation. We are a something else, and often very invisible in the data. And one thing that is very visible in this room here today is how many Native people we have in the room with us. Every year, this conference has grown more and more of a presence of our Native American partners here in Montana. Our Montana Native Home Ownership Coalition has come a long way at, at inclusion and inviting more people to the table. So if you are a Native American citizen of a tribal nation in Montana or anywhere else, if you are coming from a tribal community in Montana um, or a part of the Native Home Ownership Coalition, would you please stand so everyone can see you? Stand with you. Thank you. We have members here from Salish and Kootenai, uh, from Fort Belknap back in the corner. We have, um, uh, I believe we have a little bit of Fort Peck here. We have the Blackfeet Nation, um, I think a little, little shell, a number of many, many. I don't mean to leave anybody out, but thank you for being here today. I'll pass it over to my partners to begin introducing. Good morning, my name is Libby Starling. As Kaya said, I'm a senior community development advisor with the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis. And in this particular presentation, I'm coming to you from the Center for Indian Country Development. I'll let Ben introduce himself. Good morning, everybody. My name is Ben Navarro. I work for Fannie Mae, and as I'll describe a little bit in my presentation, I lead the implementation of our rural duty to serve work, which includes targeted strategies for Native American housing. And I'm Tanya Plummer. I'm a citizen of Sisseton Wapiton Oyate. I am Dakota, Assiniboine, and Cree. And I'm the director of Native American Housing Programs for Enterprise Community Partners. So as your first speaker this morning, I get to give you some context for what we mean when we say beyond the asterisk nation. And then I'll be talking about what the Center for Indian Country Development is doing to resolve some of the data gaps facing Indian country. So the first thing that I do have to say is that the views expressed here are mine and mine alone and do not represent the Minneapolis Fed or the Federal Reserve System. And no, I cannot comment on interest rates. <laughs> so the Center for Indian Country Development at the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis is a special research and policy think tank that is focused on tribal economic prosperity. So our mission is to advance the economic self-determination and prosperity of Native nations and indigenous communities through actionable data and research that makes substantial contributions to public policy. So with that, a key part of our work has been addressing the data gaps that face Indian country. So we have undergone a significant expansion of our staff capacity, doubling or tripling, depending on what you see as the baseline of that in order to resolve some of the data challenges that face Native nations. So when we talk about the asterisk nation and there's data challenges, these come up in a number of ways. A few years ago, a large cable network news put out the data of white, Latino, black, and something else. And so this is one of the examples of how Indian country and Native Americans become invisible in data. And so this comes out in a number of different ways. 
So the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics, our core source of information about employment, labor force participation, unemployment rates. So in asking the question, how many American Indian and Alaska Native workers are employed or unemployed? For years, you couldn't really get that information. So it wasn't until January 2022, after the Center for Indian Country Development started putting out the data on unemployment and employment among Native Americans across the country, that the Bureau of Labor Statistics started putting out this information on a regular basis. Previously, they would provided the data for Asian, Black, Latino, and white workers, but not for Native Americans. So the information does exist, but for example, in a single month, that might be based on only 900 people across the entire country. So the official line from the Bureau of Labor Statistics is the measures tend to be fairly volatile. In other words, there's a certain amount of suspicion on it because the data and the sample size simply don't exist. Another piece is coming from my own larger organization, the Federal Reserve System. So yearly, the Fed puts out a survey called the Survey of Consumer Finances, the SCF. This is often a core source of information about uh, median income, and in particular, wealth held by different groups. You'll note in the fine print that the Survey of Consumer Finances allows the user to disaggregate pulling out white non-Hispanic, black non-Hispanic, Hispanic, and other, our favorite data type. And even in the information that we saw earlier this morning from the Department of Housing and Urban Development, in the information about race, racial disaggregations in Montana, I noticed that Native Americans did not, were not represented in some of the slides that we saw earlier this morning. So again, Native Americans don't exist in some of the core data. And with this, there's a lot that we don't know about housing in Indian country. So there have been no recent national surveys of what housing needs are. There's not necessarily a centralized, publicly available, publicly available source of what's happening in terms of mortgage products and availability. There's no single comprehensive public data set of the work that community, native community development financial institutions are doing in mortgage lending. And in some cases, some of the research exists, but fails to center native voices and native experiences in understanding the data. So there's a lot that we don't know at this point. But as I said a moment ago, the Center for Indian Country Development is working to address and close these data gaps by pulling out publicly available data, and in some cases more confidential data, and highlighting this to help Native Americans better tell stories. So for example, we have the Native Community Data Profiles that I'll be walking through, the Native American Funding and Finance Atlas, Native American Financial Institutions Map, and the Native American Labor Market Dashboard that, as I said, puts out that data on employment and unemployment for Native Americans in a way that the Bureau of Labor Statistics had not done. So the QR code does provide a direct link. And I think it's important to note that while we're providing a lot of tools that provide disaggregated public data for Native Americans, we also know that a lot of what happens in tribal communities may or may not show up in the data. And that's why Tanya and Ben will be going into more depth about the Native American housing journey. So walking through the Native community data profiles, this is intended to be a single source of data that gathers information from a number of different data sources for a place-based look at what's happening in Native communities. So walking through some of the core pieces of it, the first thing when people are using the Native community data profiles is to select a Native geography. And then we have a range of topics. Place, people, housing, education, healthcare, connectivity, work, and money. So for each of these, for each native geography, for example, looking at money, we can see the median household income per person income, poverty rates, and share of youth experiencing poverty. Now, the lines that I've highlighted in yellow on this, this represent the nation as a whole, across all people, across all races, across all origins. So this allows the user to compare what's happening in a particular native geography to the U.S. as a whole. So here we see that Fort Belknap, 
lags on median household income and per person income, while having higher poverty rates than the nation as a whole. When we look at housing, for example, <clears throat> we see the number of housing units, the share that are owner occupied, um, as well as what the distribution is of the housing stock in each native geography. When using the tool itself, highlighting provides, highlighting a specific data point allows the user the opportunity to see a narrative description of what the data point means. So there's a way of accessing this for people who understand charts and people who prefer words to explain the charts to them. And the final piece that I will note on the Native Community Data Profiles is that there is a link to other sources of information, for example, from the Census Bureau, that go into further detail about what's happening in each Native geography. I mentioned some of the other data tools that the Center for Indian Country Development has recently released. One of these is the Native American Funding and Finance Atlas. This provides an extensive array of information for, again, native geographies and allows the user to look at, for example, what I have highlighted here, a project funded through the Low Income Housing Tax Credit and looking at the year placed in service, the number of units that are designated for lower income households. So this information exists for all native geographies across the country. Another tool looks at Native American financial institutions, allowing the users to identify where there's a Native CDFI or other dimensions of Native American financial institutions, including banks and credit unions. So what we do know on the broader research base about housing in Indian country is that there's a range of Native communities and a range of housing needs across the country. People say, if you've met one Native community, you've met one Native community. However, there are some broad challenges, including inadequate supply of housing, overcrowding, and physically substandard homes. And we know that not every Native community has the same challenges and opportunities. One piece of research that the Center for Indian Country recently released is looking at home financing costs in Indian Country. And here we see that Native American borrowers often pay more to finance their homes than white borrowers who have a several similar credit risk looking at credit score. And this is particularly true for Native American borrowers on reservations. One reason is the heavy reliance on home-only loans, so looking at chassis loans or loans that don't have the grounding of the land underneath it. However, the disproportionate use of home-only loans cannot be explained does not explain the full differential in those mortgage interest rates that Native Americans are paying. So this remains a source of ongoing research and inquiry for the Center for Indian Country Development. Another area where the Center for Indian Country Development has done a lot of work is looking at Native CDFIs, Native Community Development Financial Institutions, and how they improve uh, credit outcomes and loan performance, particularly for individuals who might have might not have established credit histories. So looking at how community connections and relationships can facilitate an improved access to credit. So with that, the Center for Indian Country Development, again, is working to address the data gaps that face Indian Country. We have an array of data tools on our website that I encourage you to uh, reach out, take a look, snap the QR code as some of you are doing, and help us help you address the challenges in Indian country. So with that, I will turn it over to Ben. Thank you, Libby. The Minneapolis Fed has provided valuable information about Native American economies and housing for a long time. And, and Tanya and I are gonna share some of the work that our respective organizations Enterprise Community Partners and Fannie Mae have been working on together for the past couple of years. Specifically, we work together on a forthcoming research project called the Native Housing Journey. But before I get into the Native Housing Journey, um, I want to talk a little bit about Fannie Mae's recent work in the space. So as I mentioned a moment ago, I lead the implementation of Fannie Mae's duty to serve rural mar housing market. And for those not familiar with the duty to serve, Congress and in turn our regulator, the FHFA, 
asked Fannie Mae to improve its support for the rural housing market at large and for certain specific rural populations, including tribal members living in tribal areas. As a result of this regulatory mandate, Fannie Mae supported technical assistance for Native American developers of multifamily housing, training for Native CDFIs on participating in the secondary mortgage market, and supporting HUD approval for Native American housing counseling organizations. Most notably, perhaps, though, has been the rollout of the Native American Conventional Lending Initiative, or NACLI for short, which brings all of Fannie Mae's single-family mortgage offerings to tribal land. Given our, our progress over the past few years and, and, this, and this history, we took stock of our larger strategy in early 2023 and realized that to make a lasting difference in housing outcomes for Native Americans, we needed to do two things. First, we have to dr dramat dramatically increase the number of tribes and lenders per participating in the NACLI program. I won't delve deeply into this uh, right now, but if anyone can help us promote more conventional mortgage lending on tribal lands to tribal members, and wants to discuss more, I would welcome a conversation. I'll be here all conference. Uh, second, we needed to consider whether simply offering the same product available elsewhere to Indian country is, in fact, a sufficient strategy. Do Native American homeowners and renters face unique challenges and barriers that require more targeted solutions? So to explore that second possibility, we decided to embark on this Native housing journey, which follows the template of other research documents that Fannie Mae has published in recent years specifically the black housing journey and the Latino housing journey. So I'm going to briefly walk you through that now. <coughs> this is our, our web page for our housing journeys. Oh, is it not? It's not showing. There we go. Thank you, Todd. I appreciate that. Um, so we'll walk through the... the two existing housing journeys before Tanya and I preview the native housing journey. So this work all started when Fannie Mae's board of directors and senior management uh, took a look at the, uh, the racial home ownership gap. Uh, you see a snapshot of it here from a few years ago and asked us to look into what some of the causes could be and what some uh, potential solutions might be uh, for, these, for these populations uh, that, that have the largest home ownership gap. Um, Eventually, that research expanded to a much broader analysis of challenges for both homeowners and renters. And as you'll see here, some of the common obstacles that come across from this research for, for um, black families and Latino families are uh, financial reality, so things like higher debt to income ratios and rental cost burdens, um, bias uh, across a number of things, but that would include things like appraisal bias. Um, lack of affordable housing supply, uh, which, is, which is common across many populations, obviously, and um, housing vulnerability, specific, specifically aging and substandard housing. Um, anybody who wants to check out this document uh, can find Fannie Mae's housing journey. And here at the bottom, you see a link to our research and data where you can see the complete um, research document, which is uh, definitely worth reading, but you have to carve out some time to, to get through it all. Um, I want to highlight a couple of things about these existing housing journeys. So the first is the framework that uh, um, is the baseline for all of this work on any population, whether it's black families, Latino families, or Native American families. Um, and that's what we call the consumer housing journey here. You can see that uh, it, it really captures all the steps that a, a renter or a prospective homeowner would take to uh, access housing, move in and maintain their housing, and then potentially to move and sell. So somebody can go through this cycle several times over their lifetime. Uh, this will be a, a, a familiar image that we'll talk about here in a moment, but within each of these sectors, uh, we've identified common obstacles. And as you can see here, for, for black families and Latino families, some of the common obstacles are some of those that I mentioned, access to credit, housing costs, inadequate affordable supply, financial resilience, and property resilience. Um, the second thing I wanted to highlight in these, in these existing housing journeys is uh, you'll find, as I scroll down here, some, or I'll scroll up, some, some specific primary analyses of, of the data for, for given populations. Um, as I say, I'm not going to dig into this in great detail here. Uh, but another important contribution of this work is that it acts as a literature review of um, the housing uh, challenges and opportunities for these various 
populations, and, and this is just an example of one page of the Latino housing journey, um, which shows uh, all of the, the research sources that undergird this analysis and also calls out some key points and implications. So the, the upcoming nat native housing journey will, will similarly feature this structure. So with this background on Fannie Mae's housing journey research, we wanted to expand to Native American populations since, according to many metrics, some of which Libby called out, Native Americans face some of the most challenging housing conditions in the country. We decided to work with Tanya and her team at Enterprise Community Partners who have a long history serving this population. Now unfortunately, despite the research being complete, uh, we're still working on our publication process. So I don't have a final copy to share for you today or a link that I can share, um, but I can say that we expect it to be public in the coming weeks. So today we'll walk you through a few excerpts that we, we think are uh, uh, valuable food for thought. Finally, we know that the native housing journey won't solve the data gap, uh, but we're hopeful that it can be a meaningful contribution to the research and from Fannie Mae's perspective, maybe something that helps us drive our strategy for improving housing finance for Native American families moving forward. So with that, um, I will share a quick preview of the Native housing journey as I noted. So again, this consumer housing journey that we just saw a moment ago is something that will be, it will be uh, uh, consistent with the Native housing journey. Again, thinking separately about the steps renters need to think about uh, uh, as well as the steps that, that uh, prospective homeowners need to think about. But before we get into some of the, the specific data points that touch on each of these areas, we have to think about the, the historical context. And Tanya, would you mind walking us through a little bit about this, this slide here? I can't. Actually, I had something to say about the first slide. Oh, Do you mind going yes, back a little bit? All right, thanks. Um, I just want to note that as we break apart this Native American housing journey, we can see the basic steps of the housing and home ownership here, um, all the pieces that, that put that puzzle together. Um, and they are essentially the same, really, with every human. So black, Latino, Native American, and other people groups. However, we as human beings are not processes or we're not steps. So in the same way that we'd all like to see our own life plans work out, you grow up, you get your education, you get married, you have kids, you raise kids, and they're all smart and beautiful and successful. You take vacations, you travel, you invest, you retire, it's perfect. We'd love to see a life plan like that work, and we'd love to see the housing and home ownership work perfectly, and yet we're human beings. Um, the housing journey is essentially static, but the way that people interact with it is determined by their early experiences. And so a part of, as a part of this journey, we will also identify the core steps as well as the opportunities and barriers that are faced by Native people and Native communities as they engage with it. For thousands of years, tribal nations of the Americas abided by their own systems for recognizing and enforcing property rights to their territory and management of their resources. This is a unique distinction about the native housing journey because we are not talking about a racial demographic any longer. We're talking about people who are tribal citizens with a unique political distinction with the United States federal government and who hold dual citizenship. The history of policy towards Native Americans impacts the housing journey that's experienced today. Native people, particularly our tribes in Montana, are deeply connected to our lands. In fact, this year is the 100th anniversary of the Indian Citizen Act, the Citizenship Act, allowing Native citizens to become United States citizens on our own lands, lands that we've previously stewarded on our own, and to vote a right still not fully recognized until the mid-60s. On this timeline, you can see various eras that tell the story of the federal government not quite knowing what to do with Indians. When you're working with Native people, every single you Native, Native person that you talk to um, is either a boarding school survivor themselves or a descendant of a boarding school survivor. And that directly impacts our worldview, our early education, our belief in ourselves, and our economies. Most damaging to the housing and home ownership today is the Dawes Act. During this allotment era, over 90 million acres of native land was lost. Treaties were signed, treaties were broken. Finally, after the Indian Reorganization Act in 1934, that's when my grandfather became one of the original signers of the Fort Belknap Constitution, we began to see tribes placed on reservations with land held in trust with the federal government as though we were wards that needed help managing our own lands. 
These lands were not always first pick for settlers and developers. They often lacked adequate access to water, to infrastructure, to farming, ranching, and to being able to grow well. They're often fractionated, making development significantly difficult today. Thank you for that important context, Tanya. So one of the first data points that the enterprise research team pointed out to us at Fannie Mae uh, was this one here, which, which really caught our attention because of, of what Fannie Mae does, focusing on, on expanding home finance opportunities. And that's that um, Native Americans, of, uh, compared to all of the other populations group, population groups as defined by the American Community Survey, are the, are the least likely to have a mortgage on their home. So 58% of Native American homeowners own their home free and clear, uh, leaving 42% using a mortgage product. And what's interesting about that, that statistic is that that's persistent across, across all income groups. So you can see on the right-hand slide, it's the green bar that captures um, American Indian, Alaska Native, non-Latinos. Uh, and that is the lowest bar for every income group. So this population just is less likely to use uh, housing finance, which is, of course is important to Fannie Mae. Now I'll say, there's nothing inherently wrong with that. Um, perhaps it's a goal to, to, to own a home without, without having to finance it. But as we'll talk about in the next few slides, I think there, there are possibly some, some connections to the housing stock quality when you don't have access to uh, the finance market and, and the equity in, of your home. Um, and that's something that Fannie Mae cares deeply about. Um, so uh, with that, I'll, well, Tanya, did you have anything to share on this slide? Just that this particular uh, statistic was surprising to us when we dug into the research. It was surprising actually to hear that Native Americans are more likely to own their own home because we thought that that would not be the case. And yet when we look deeper at it, that's because of federal Indian policy. It's because of the 1937 Act. It's because of the old mutual self-help program that's now sunset. It's a part of our policy history. And so to really dig into it and tell the real story, we had to look at what do these homes look like today? Which is a perfect segue with um, uh, something that the American Community Survey allowed us to delve into, which was water source. So. Um, while Native American households are more likely than other groups to be homeowners, this doesn't mean they necessarily live in high quality homes. So as you can see here, about 4% of Native American households do not have access to heated piped water. And this figure is 6% for those who don't have a mortgage. So I mentioned earlier, not having access to your home's equity might limit your ability to, to um, uh, improve the conditions of your home. Uh, so you see that, that figure rise to 6%. And then for those living in rural geographies, a lot of these folks living on or near uh, their, their tribal lands, that's 7%. So it's not uh, a majority, but it's a very high figure. 7% of people uh, in, in rural communities who don't have a mortgage living in homes without heated and piped water. Uh, similarly, the ACS allowed us to look at the heating source. And as with most other uh, um, American households, uh, they tend to have electricity or gas to heat their home, but a full 16% burn wood to heat their homes, which is a substantially higher ratio than other groups. Um, if we limit, again, the population who don't have a mortgage, who own their home free and clear, the percentage who heat their home with wood uh, rises to 25%. So again, we think this is a suggestion that w not having access to mortgage finance could be uh, correlated with uh, less common housing characteristics. And I think, Tanya, you had a couple of uh, images here to share that, that kind of hammer this point home. I do, and before I get into that, I want to be very clear that it's important that we don't always subscribe to poverty porn when we're talking about housing in Indian country. So even though this is a reality of many of our homes, for every one of these difficult pictures, I could also show you some pretty amazing subdivisions and some beautiful developments that some progressive tribal nations are undertaking. And so I hope that behind this you know that there are still tribal nations who are incredibly strong, incredibly resilient, growing, and doing successful things. And yet, today, still in 2024, we have homes I lost my notes here. We have homes that, that look like this. This is a couple of years ago at the Navajo Nation. My dad is a pastor, and during the middle of COVID, he had a pastor friend who'd said, Bruce, our people are starving. These are parts that are not in Gallup or Chinle. They are way out, and it's hard to get to those areas, and there were no services going out there. And so we loaded up 
several trucks of 40,000 pounds of food and beans and rice and water and other things and actually engaged a whole bunch of churches across the country to build chicken coops and buy chickens. And so we took chicken coops and chickens. And these are the homes that we were invited into to visit. So this is a reality today. Um, so America has not touched the moon. We've built electronic vehicles. A trip to Disney World feels like old hat for a lot of families. And we still have Native families bucketing water into their homes today. So this is on the left, a, a blanket for a door. Um, you can see the wood heat coming out and a number of just different ply boards and, and boards just patching this home barely together. The fellow that lived in that home, so happy, so sweet, so kind, and so grateful for some food to be brought to him. Um, it did not impact his uh, outlook on life necessarily. He was grateful for his home, but, but this is the quality of that home. Inside another family, um, we, she, she made a, she's a jewelry maker. Under her bed was all this beautiful jewelry. Um, you can see the home sweet home sign up there and a dirt floor with a rug on top of it. So just very interesting today. Um, we could look at the next slide as well. Um, similar to the heating issues, there's a, a statistic that's on that last slide that's kind of staggering. 25% of native homeowners with no mortgage have to chop wood and heat their homes with a wood stove or fireplace is their only source of heat. And so I wanted to share with you that we see this anecdotally, anecdotally as we're traveling the country. We spend a lot of time in community with the tribal partners that we serve, um, looking at housing developments with them. And so this community was at Macaw, Washington, and we toured through a subdivision. Every single home was just piled high with wood because that was their only heat source in that area. You see often homes that are boarded up, uh, either because of drug use or, or other deficiencies. And then the other picture is of manufactured housing. Libby mentioned um, something about a lot of chattel loans and a lack of education about whether or not a manufactured home can be a, a, an appreciating asset or how to take care of it or of the need to put it on a permanent foundation. Everywhere we go, we see manufactured homes that look just like this. And at some point, they walked into a dealer who was like, you can get in a home for $40,000 and pay a 26% interest rate. Um, and so this is the impact on those communities today. Thank you, Tanya. So this next slide looks at renters. Um, as you'll note, some of the, the previous data points we talked about really were specific to homeowners. So on the left side, this is just a national statistic on uh, comparing renter income and gross rent. And this is a, a common story you've, you've heard on the news, I'm sure. Rent is increasing faster than an income. Um, and the right-hand slide breaks this out according to population group. And again, the Native American population is there in, in dark green. Um, you'll see relatively similar rates to other, other population groups, but a, a, a notable takeaway that's consistent across all racial groups is that the level of cost burden is um, appreciably higher for multifamily renters as opposed to single-family renters. So us at Fannie Mae, thinking about what we might do with this data, uh, we have a multifamily business that focuses on developing housing for, um, for all Americans, but perhaps with Native American populations, we can really focus on uh, strategies that would make the, uh, the, the home more affordable to the renter and decrease that cost burden. This next slide um, is, is, is quite interesting. This is uh, really something that Enterprise, through their literature review, uh, identified, but that kind of reinforce something we already know, which is there is a systemic lack of data for Native American populations. One thing I'll share is that the other housing journeys that, that are published today, the Black and Latino housing journeys, have a good amount of information uh, that pulls from Fannie Mae's own survey data of homeowners and renters, and we're able to, to analyze that and, and tell stories with that, with that data. We weren't able to replicate any of that for the Native housing journey because sample sizes were so small. And I think that's a common theme with a lot of the existing research. And it's, it's a shame. And this, um, this uh, pie chart here on this slide really is a good example of it. So um, Tanya, I think I'll, I'll let you maybe describe what you all found with regard to the, um, the, the, the literature, literature view of um, the racial wealth gap across different population groups. Yeah, I, I think I would just echo a lot of Libby's comments earlier that we're invisible. We're just absolutely invisible. We are the other, the something else um, that's just not out there, not even often mentioned. In, in certain studies. So it was very, very difficult to tell an accurate Native housing journey story without any data to tell the story. So we've got stories, things that we've heard from tribes that we're working with, high demand in, in areas, but 
we can't really count on that because we're not tracking that in a consistent manner. That's right. So one staggering number here is that uh, of this recent literature review of, of published works on racial wealth gaps, 77% either did not include any commentary on Native Americans or used that asterisk that uh, you know, really doesn't delve deeply into their experience. So back to the housing journey framework that we've spoken about several times now. Again, through the, the research that, that Enterprise led, uh, analyzing information that's already out there and then uh, conducting some primary research, we were able to identify some key barriers that Native Americans face, and those are on the right. Um, these are probably familiar because these are some of the ones that came up in the, in the black and Latino housing journeys, um, but some of them are distinct. So limited credit history, data gaps, inadequate affordable supply, financial resilience, and property durability. I think all of these things are, 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 are themes that we touched on that the housing journey, when it's published, will go into greater detail on. So the next step, once we had, had identified key barriers, was to think about the Venn diagram. How does this overlap with these other populations that we've studied? Um, because perhaps the solution is something that can be uh, developed and then um, specifically marketed and promoted with each of the, the impacted populations. And we found several of them. So um, each group is affected by historical discrimination in their own unique way. Um, each face banking deserts or lack of access to financial institutions. Higher incidence of housing cost burden, which we spoke about a moment ago. Inadequate affordable supply. Lack of credit. Uh, financial profiles, gig economy income, higher instance of credit invisibility, limited savings for upfront housing costs like a down payment or a deposit, uh, larger household, uh, lower household income on average. And then regarding experience, uh, aging, inadequate or insufficient housing stock, higher incidence of exposure to environmental hazards and climate risks, and misperceptions or difficult experiences in, a, in obtaining a mortgage. So with that, Tanya, I'll turn it over to you to, to speak on uh, some of the perspectives from Enterprise Community Partners. Thanks, Ben. Uh, so that last slide that you saw the circles and you saw the Native American on the bottom side in the green, I want you to pretend that you have a zoom lens and could you know, go into that with a microscope and see how absolutely beautiful it is. It is full of resilient, beautiful people who are brave thinkers and absolutely moving the needle on access to housing and home ownership and capital in their communities. And they're doing it in a way that, that honors their values uh, and that honors uh, what our ancestors would have us live and breathe and move by. Um, just sharing with you some pictures of some of our Montana practitioners. Um, this uh, coalition building this occurrence is happening in a number of states and a number of nations across the United States. Enterprise works with coalitions in South Dakota, in Montana, in Idaho, in Arizona, in New Mexico, and starting soon in Wisconsin. Um, these are grassroots people and organizations, both native and non-native, that are coming together to say, let's fix this together. And that's it. Let's just lean into each other's brain power and hearts and resources and fix this together. So even though we are invisible in the data, we are very real in real life. Um, this top left is the very first uh, revived homeownership gathering that was held um, in Helena in 2022. From that came a strategic plan for how we were going to approach housing issues for Native Americans in Montana and increase home ownership opportunities. Um, that group, many of you who are in that group are here today and I'm still grateful for the continued involvement and we have more. I love this middle picture because it's a picture of the Blackfeet Nation and Crow and women leaders um, from Native CDFIs and from their housing authorities working together. And it's critical that we have parts of the ecosystem working together. Uh, the other photo is um, Jody Perez at Salish Kootenai Housing Authority and a new homeownership development and our coalition steering committee getting together for strategic planning. Um, we just had a lot of really good times together. I would be remiss if I didn't note it on the bottom right-hand corner. You can see Bob Gochi on the screen in the back, who is our godfather of Indian House. Yeah, give Bob Gochi a hand. <laughs> He's a beautiful, powerful human who's done incredible work for Indian housing, and those of us that attempt to carry the torch would be just only so pleased if we could even do a portion of what he has done. Um, but that's our steering committee standing, having watched uh, a video that he shared recently. 
Um, it truly takes a village for this to work. I think some of the work that we do often is sort of debunk some myths about what it's like working in Indian country, and we often think that we're working with the tribes themselves all of the time. Um, something that in our, our work with the White House Council on Native American Affairs and Department of Interior and some of the federal agencies is that much of their consultation, and rightly so, is focused on the tribes themselves, and yet behind the scenes, those are not always the worker bees. The worker bees are your housing authorities, your native CDFI, your native nonprofits, your land departments, planning departments, those parts of the ecosystem that actually do the work on the ground. And so it does take a village of those pieces of the ecosystem to begin to work together, to begin to leverage their assets that, they're, uh, that they are accessible to through the federal government and funding systems, um, and to come together and see things move faster. So we do a lot of work in this space. Uh, we can move to the next slide. We've spent a lot of time documenting what a healthy, ecosystem looks like. In dominant society, in Missoula, in Bozeman, in Kalispell, and other places, you have active developers, for-profit and non-profit developers, land available, they work within a system of, of codes and other things. That phenomenon does not happen the same way in Indian country. There are not traditional developers in Indian country. You have your housing authorities that have an annual Indian housing block grant that has no, been nowhere near sufficiently funded over the last 10 years, uh, at least. And it's not even been permanently reauthorized. And so when you drive by our reservations and wonder, why don't they build some houses? It's because public HUD funding has continued to climb, and yet the percentage of Indian housing funding has continued to decrease. It is, it is uh, a, a significant disparity. So that is, that's largely why. So we've leaned into what does it mean to have a strong housing ecosystem within Indian country? What are the core components of that? And we really came up with uh, four key things, four key outcomes that we're looking for. At the end of the day, we're not just looking for access to capital. We're just not looking for gross of native CDFIs. We're not just looking for housing authorities to get more money. We're looking for all of it. We want stronger families safety, security, stability at home. We want stronger industries, stronger economies, um, strength in every asset there. To get there, we determine that there are four core components of that, that is demand. Who is living within our community? Who, who's been pushed away from the reservation and wants to come home? We looked at that federal Indian policy. There was a, a, an era there where the government gave Indians a one-way bus ticket to the nearby urban city and just said, get a job, assimilate, figure out how to get by in life. So we have a lot of Native people who are living in urban places today who would love to come home if they could. That's the market. That's, that's who we're really targeting for home ownership and for reviving tribal economies. We also have many who have doggedly stayed because this is home, this is my land, and my poverty level, if I even look at that, doesn't define me. Um, but we want to see revival here. So demand, who is our markets? Social and emotional infrastructure. Do we have homeowners who are prepared for home ownership? Do we have access to financial empowerment counseling? Uh, I always say, I hate to say financial literacy. Native people of all people are the most resourceful. We've known what to do with our resources, but functioning in traditional financial systems today is different than it always has been for us. And so we're looking at financial empowerment, and that's a top down from our tribal leadership down to the, our, our newborns knowing I can be successful, I can grow up and have a job and own a home here at home on my reservation, and I don't have to leave the res for my life to matter. That's the narrative we're wanting to change. Um, construction and development. I found this working as a native CDFI uh, director uh, years ago. You can't find that homes that don't exist. And so housing stock, housing supply, that's probably the place where we most align with dominant society. We all have a housing stock problem and need to fix it. And so do we have construction workers? Do we have building codes, zoning codes, planning, land use, all of those things that build uh, a construction ecosystem? And then how do we pay for it? How do we pay for development? And then how do we access capital for mortgage finance when Indian country is significantly redlined? All of the major lenders pulled out of the HUD 184 program. We now have um, Fannie Mae working with the, their NACLI system to have an agreement with the federal government that this is how we're gonna work together. We have Freddie Mac who's developed Heritage One as a product. We have USDA with 502 direct loans and guarantee loans and the HUD 184. We have conventional government, VA, NADL. There are multiple products. We just have to have stronger ecosystems that allow us to access them. 
So I want to share with you, Enterprise is having a holding a first national summit in Boise, Idaho in August, focused on this ecosystem. Um, and we've invited the number of the federal agencies, our state partners, all of our tribal nations and the partners that we're working with to talk together about really looking at this ecosystem and what it means and also working with philanthropy to drive capital um, to these communities to, to improve access to resources so that the native housing journey can be realized in, <clears throat> in the way it's intended to be realized so that we can be seen and no longer invisible and our voices are heard loud and clear. So we invite you to come to all of that and I think we could open it up for a couple of questions. Any questions? Okay, I have one. We really try in all of our work to come from an asset and opportunity focus. And yet, we also have to show what the challenges are in order to elevate the need. So talk about how you think about that in data and in how you use the data. I'll get things started. Um, I'm really glad you asked that question, Kaya, because um, I'm realizing my last slide, which is the list of, of barriers, let me scroll back to it. I. Uh, I kind of left, left us on a negative note. I, I talked about what all the barriers are without talking about possible solutions. And in truth, Fannie Mae's not there yet. We, we, are, we are a very process-oriented organization, and the first step is identifying those barriers and then filtering them down to those that Fannie Mae could plausibly address because we have a very specific role in the secondary mortgage market. We can't lend. Um, we can't build houses. So this list that we're looking at here are, are, the, are the issues that we believe are, are uh, those that can be addressed in some capacity by Fannie Mae. The next step, the hard work going forward, is going to be figuring out exactly what we're doing about it. And I can't make any commitments to exactly what that's going to be. But I'll say, kind of to Tanya's point, housing supply and housing quality are, are both frequent um, themes here. And I think offering a secondary mortgage market for construction loans that really work on the reservation or near the reservation um, uh, rehab loans, loans to improve existing, existing structures. Those are things that naturally my mind is drawn to and, um, and I think Fannie Mae will be looking at very seriously once this housing journey is, is complete and published. I would just say context um, and don't see it just for what you think it is and ask, be curious, be really curious about how did that come to be? That's why we spent so much time talking about federal Indian policy and what shapes the worldview for Native Americans today. And so don't end it, why aren't they building? Why is it this way? Why is it so hard? Ask why, why does that exist? You know, and, and delve deeper into the story to understand the context. I'll build on Tanya's comment and note we're very proud of our Native community data profiles that I showed you. And we recently had an example where we asked some members of the tribal nations that we were talking about just to data fact check an article that we're working on. And a consistent theme that we heard was a yes and, yes and you're missing the story, yes and you're miss missing the context about what's happening in our places. So just to reiterate, the data is a starting point, not the ending point for understanding the context and what's happening in different places and communities. I have just one more thing, if I can, Kaya. Sorry. Um, seek the good. This is something that I taught my kids growing up. If you seek trouble, it's going to find you. If you seek good, you will find it. And so I encourage you, those folks who stood earlier today um, representing Native CDFIs and tribal communities, ask them, meet them, and ask them, what's going good? What good thing has happened in your community? Listen to the good things, uh, because we don't often look for that, and it's easy to talk about the things that are hard. So seek it, find it, highlight it, be proud of it. Great. We're, we're all working on celebrating, right? We're in the work day to day, day to day, day to day. So stopping and celebrating those wins is a good reminder for all of us. Other questions for this panel? Wonderful.
Hi. Um, once you, you mentioned before, do I need to introduce myself? <laughs> My name is Kimberly Carr, I'm, I'm with Freddie Mac. You mentioned um, a little bit of a data um, thing that I, I wanted to question about. You said we are trying to make connections with the tribes, but the people on the ground doing the work are the, the CDFIs. Is there any type of central repository or anything that says, hey, these CDFIs are working with this tribe? Is there anywhere where we could go? Because one of the things, the barriers that we have is we have lending partners, we have connections on the banking side that want to work with different tribes and different tribal areas. However, they're new to it. They don't know where to start. They don't know where to go. They don't know. They may be in North Dakota or Washington, but don't know what tribes to work with because they're just not familiar. Where would you suggest that they get that connection um, between all of the entities that work in certain groups so that they know who's out there and who to make the connections with. I'll start and then I'm sure that Libby has some things to add to that um, because the Center for Indian Country Development has some great resources and maps that you can go to. I'll let her talk more about that. You can reach out to the tribe and ask them what is your ecosystem? Who's doing this work in your community? Do you have um, a TDHE who is developing and a native CDFI? I think both are equally as critical. Um, we have an, j probably just as many housing authorities and TDHEs that are managing their own mortgage portfolios as you have native CDFIs. Um, there are more of them spread out and there are not enough CDFIs to cover all of the communities. And yet we have others like in Montana who meet the, they cover the entire state. And so they're not limited to just that one tribe. So I would look at those resources, but also look at the ecosystem and find out who's doing the work in that community and how can they be working together, don't work with just one. So the Center for Indian Country Development has the Native American Financial Institutions map that I showed briefly in the slides, which would allow someone to say, I'm looking for a native CDFI, and then mapping onto that as well where native lands are. So someone could say, I'm looking for a native CDFI that is located in this reservation area. Um, and presumably, it's a bit of a leap to say that they're serving the area where they're located, we don't necessarily know that, but I think it's probably a fair assumption that those native CDFIs are serving the lands where they are located, and so that information is all available on our map on our website. I'd also watch um, HUD notices. They'll, allow, they'll uh, put who gets the annual Indian Housing, competitive Indian Housing Block Grant Awards and ICDBG awards. Those tribes will be developing, and it's the Housing Authority. National American Indian Housing Council will have information on um, who's serving where. I would say those of you in Montana, if you're curious about that question, we had a re bank recently ask, what's my missed opportunity? We pulled out a HUD 184 a long time ago, should we re-enter the market space? The answer is yes. There is a market there for you. Reach out to the Montana Native Home Ownership Coalition. Um, you can find us on the NeighborWorks website. Tyler Baker, I don't know if you're in the room, he is our, right here in the back, raise hand, he's our program manager. Talk to Tyler about what nations are there if you're a lender locally and interested in that. Okay, uh, yeah, one more. Angie, please. Hi, I'm Angie Main. I'm the executive director for NACDC Financial Services. We're located on the Blackfeet Reservation, but our service area is all of Montana with uh, urban reservation, but I'd like to address that question that you asked. Um, there's um, the native CDFI network that mo the majority of us are members. If you go to their website, you can, um, you know, you'll see all of the native CDFIs throughout the nation pretty much because we're, there, we're seven strong, but we're all members of, um, the native CDFI network, pretty much. And then also we get a lot of our funding from the Department of Treasury. And so if you go into the Department of Treasury and you click on the native CDFIs, we're all listed there because we've all received <laughs> funding, um, hope, you know, fortunately, for, for the majority of us. So it, and you can click on there and it tells which, um, where, where, where all of our service areas which a lot of us don't, um, aren't really affiliated with a, a tribal government. 
the majority of us are autonomous uh, for various reasons. <laughs> of course, a lot of it having to do with the, um, with the um, US Treasury and becoming a certified native CDFI. So there's a lot of reasons behind that. But uh, if you clicked on NACDC Financial Services, you'll be able to see that our service area is Native Americans throughout Montana. So. Great, good additional context. Thanks, Angie. Okay, join me in thanking our panel. Wonderful, thank you. So I think Angie's gonna be speaking later this afternoon, you know, pointing to that conversation of how do we transition, how do we use data and stories and local context? I think if you're interested in more around um, what's happening in our Native communities across the state, the afternoon session today I think is gonna be really fantastic. And I know many of you are staying for the Native Homeownership Coalition gathering tomorrow. We're looking forward to that as well. So we are heading into breakout sessions at 11.15.